Uh, first of all, I'm very grateful for the invitation to participate in this workshop. It's been very interesting. I've learned a lot in the past two days. And unlike Ines, I will not bring a presentation, so some, there's no need to share the screen because I don't actually have specific empirical work or currently projects that I would bring to you today, but rather a reflection uh, motivated by uh, the issue of the impact of digital platforms, digital technologies in research and in particular in the social sciences and humanities. It's an issue that concerns me a lot. So I'm going to be a little pessimistic about uh, the, the, the potentials, but also the, the, the pitfalls that um, attract us to this fascinating subject, but at the same time, sometimes stops us from seeing whatever reality is beyond this. So bear with me, I, I will try to, to use less than the, a lot of 10 minutes because it's more interesting to listen to people who actually study these things than just reflections. So, um, I have done some work on digital issues. Uh, I did uh, uh, many years ago a project about the, the use of the internet by children and young people. And last year I organized, I participated in the organization of a worldwide consultation on uh, we the internet, but it was focused on governance issues and whether or not to, to, to continue with the internet governance forum. So it was more or less on demand. So this is the, the practical empirical knowledge I have on this subject. But what concerns me the most is how fascinated we all are in the past few years with everything digital. And I think that as research topic, it is endlessly fascinating because it is endlessly changing. I can say that when we, we started our project on the internet and children in 2008, perhaps, and finished in 2014. And by the time we finished the project, everything that we had written in the first two years was outdated. Reality had changed so much, so fast, that by the time we published the book, it no longer was particularly useful or particularly true. Because in the short space of six years, uh, the way uh, children and young people use the internet, the platforms that are available, the potential, the possibility had changed so much that it was frankly a bit limited to, to reread what we wrote at the beginning. And so I think that is part of the, the, the fascination and the interest of this subject is that it is endlessly changing. I think that 10 years ago, we wouldn't have dreamed of platforms like Uber and the impact they have on, on work, on employment, on daily life. And, and, it, and it's something that I don't think it's going to change so soon. So we won't reach a level of stability that we had a few years ago where we could devote ourselves to a research topic and know that it wouldn't grow old-fashioned so fast and i think that is one of the main challenges in working in this area is how much how our work becomes outdated so fast but also i would I, I think a lot about the, 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 the tools for research that digital platforms and digital technologies allow us. Uh, for some years, I used to teach uh, a summer school at my institute about online tools for social research. And that also changed a lot. We did it in three or four, five consecutive years. And we had to change the program constantly because new things appeared, old things uh, disappeared. And there was a lot of interest. It was probably one of our most popular summer schools that had to do with methodology. And it gave us the, the, the opportunity to discuss with students and to reflect on the huge wealth of uh, tools that we have at our, our disposal to perform social research and humanities research. And there's a wealth of 
literature that we are now have access to. There's a wealth of data, there's a wealth of uh, things that can be mined for information, but also we, also we even have now tools that allow us to write scientific articles almost instantaneously. If we do our work right in terms of uh, programming platforms like Mendeley or Dog Ear, they almost write the articles for ourselves. And so there's a temptation to, to use and abuse these, these research tools without sometimes considering what is behind them and how they work and how they follow patterns. And so since I'm a sociologist or I call myself a sociologist of science, that is something that concerns me. How the research practice is changing so much since we have these digital tools at our disposal. And what time is it there left and space for reflection, for offline research, for, um, for taking things slowly and really finding the connections between the, um, the, 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 the phenomena we identify? Because sometimes it's so easy just to let the, the, the programs, the software work for us that we no longer sometimes control what comes out of it. And we have tools for doing uh, qualitative analysis of content analysis of mass uh, volumes of information. And sometimes we, f we, we look at this with such fascination that we transform what should be qualitative research and interpretation and heuristics into codes and codification and quantification even of qualitative data. And then that is something that I find it sometimes troubling. And hmm, as someone was saying uh, earlier today, now we can all watch each other's homes and pets and family members through Zoom. Uh, I'm not going to, into the detail of big data because Ines already uh, spoke much more uh, fluently about it that I can do, but it's something that also concerns me, how there seems to be a fascination in uh, my research center, but also in other research centers, that it's the answer for social sciences. It's the way that will make social science and humanity scientific, because if we have huge amounts of data, we will find the laws of society somehow hidden in those data. And we discuss too little what is the ethics of accessing and using big data and how it can obfuscate, hide uh, social phenomena that are still analogic, not digital. And that is something that also concerns me when I see research that sometimes mistakes what is digital life with uh, what it is real or offline life. And if the portraits and the information that put people put up on online are truly representative of what they are in non-digital life. And I think it's, it's a temptation to replace everything that we do with uh, digital technologies. For instance, a, a point I'm particularly sensitive about is uh, web surveys and how many of my colleagues are so fascinated and many of our students, which is even more worrying, that you just have to put out, uh, put out a, a survey in a platform and disseminate it as widely as possible. And if you get a lot of answers, then the results are valid. And that is a complete, okay, mistake. Because when we still have in this country, for instance, 25, one quarter of the population that does not access the internet, we can never have samples that are representative of the population. And that is something that I think it's not discussed enough and it's just the ease and the, 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 the ease of use and the, the availability and the ability to construct data sets uh, almost instantly in, is quite concerning and I don't think we sh it's discussed enough. Also, we, we seem to be experiencing an information overload. There's no way that we can read everything that is published about a particular subject. Uh, there's no way we can keep up with all the debates that are uh, uh, ranging 
online, offline. And it, it gives us a sensation that if we always have this sensation that our work, our research work is never finished, it's always incomplete. Now we have it even further because there's, it's impossible to cover all angles of the discussions, the theories that, that are flying around. And I think it's, it's a real difficulty also in teaching how to do social science and humanities research. And also, there's also the, 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 the danger of confusing what are discussions on Twitter, on academic Twitter, with true theoretical and uh, epistemological discussions. And also, with the ease that we can collect data from these, uh, the, the sources, uh, uh, I, I think there's a real danger that we can confuse um, online discussions with real life, with uh, what really concerns people, what's, what really motivates the, 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 the public discussions that do not take place on the, the digital sphere. But also I would like to finish with the, the affordances and the, 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 the possibilities of democratization of science that these tools also uh, allow. Because it's true that now we have access to online conferences uh, that can take place anywhere in the world. And this is particularly true from researchers from the global south. Uh, the barriers of participation in, in, in science are getting lowered by digital platforms. The open access to, to literature, but also data allows us to use information that can be located anywhere. We can make international comparisons with much more ease and also allows contacts between researchers that would not have been possible uh, a few decades ago and the formation of networks collaborations that extend through space that it's it's a marvelous marvelous possibility and also the possibility to engage with our audiences in a different way it's not a replacement for face-to-face -face events and public participation, but it demolishes some barriers of participation that existed. And I think there's small reasons to be hopeful also in digital humanities. Not everything is bleak, I sometimes tend to think. And that's all. <laughs>